This is Science Friday, and I'm Sophie Bushwick. People around the world have long been fascinated by the idea that there are strange creatures out there, creatures that may or may not exist. I'm talking, of course, about cryptids, things like Bigfoot hiding out in American forests, or sea serpents lurking just below the water in coastal towns. Despite the best efforts of monster hunting TV shows and amateur sleuths, there may never be concrete proof that these creatures exist. But that doesn't stop anyone from analyzing strange photographs or or odd carcasses and saying, maybe, just maybe, cryptids do exist. So can we explain these sightings with science? Joining me today is my guest, Dr. Darren Naish, paleontologist and author based in Southampton in the United Kingdom. Welcome to Science Friday. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. You literally wrote the book on this subject, which came out in 2016. It's called Hunting Monsters, Cryptozoology, and the Reality Behind the Myths. How would you describe your relationship with cryptozoology? It's a very interesting question. And um, I would say that like uh, probably the bulk of uh, people, especially, you know, uh, qualified scientists interested in mystery animal research, my initial interest was because I thought that I thought it was like uh, a branch, the the cryptozoology, the study of cryptids, the study of monsters, unknown animals, animals known only from anecdote should be regarded as as a part of zoology so as a as a broad you know as, as part of my broad interest in zoology living and extinct uh, living and extinct animals um yeah for me it was like wow are creatures like the, the the claimed sea serpents of the cryptozoological literature and bigfoot and yeti and so on are they actual real animals that's why i got interested as a as a younger person so that's kind of like an amateur interest as a uh, you know working scientist today I do maintain an interest in that possibility that, you know, when people report sightings of these creatures, are they really describing encounters with unknown animals? I remain, you know, open to that idea to a degree and interested in it, certainly interested in any material evidence that people bring back, you know, whether you mean photographic evidence or, you know, things like hairs or DNA samples or whatever. But for me, it's kind of mostly moved into something that is actually kind of difficult to compartmentalize because um basically i think our interest in mystery animals is a part of culture so it's uh, if you're studying accounts um of mystery creatures whether whether by accounts i mean you know like stories legends or whether i mean uh like um people's claims you know modern encounters kind of modern folklore urban folklore whatever um you know what subject is that is that kind of social anthropology is it you know cultural studies um is it is it just anthropology um i'm not really sure on this and those of us interested in this subject discuss this all the time it's like where are we going with this field are we sure that it's not part of zoology is it still connected to zoology or are we completely wrong in that assumption and is it all to do with to do with culture so um so part of what i'm doing kind of feels like a uh kind of meta science it's like we're studying the studiers we're studying the cryptozoologists themselves and we're studying what they say and we're also studying the um you know the body of evidence the the, the claimed accounts rather than actually you know, I'm not like spending all my nights in the woods, you know, going in search of, uh, you know, British big cats or Bigfoot or whatever. Um, yeah, it's it's studying the study as what, what have people said about cryptozoology and how how do they think? Where do they think we're going? So that's a rambling, uh, messy answer. I'm very sorry for that. But yes, it's for me, it's quite like a confusing and messy subject. And would you describe yourself as a skeptic? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, t- totally a skeptic. Um, and I think that, unfortunately, today, that's kind of a loaded term. Um, I mean, never mind its role in, you know, the culture wars and what certain self-proclaimed skeptics, you know, the way they've used the term, it's related to all kinds of uh, uh, sometimes problematic areas. But in terms of my general approach to, uh, you know, to science, I mean, it's, it's right to be skeptical. You shouldn't accept anything without, like, uh, weighing up uh, the evidence for it uh, and w- when people talk about you know what does it mean to be skeptical of cryptozoological evidence 
uh, I would say for the most part, you know, I'm not. Con- I, I know many people that are interested in mystery animals that are like, will will be prepared to say, I am convinced that, for example, I am convinced that the Yeti is real because you know the eyewitness um, encounters are just so plausible sounding, and the you know the ecology of the animal makes sense. Um, you know, there are people that hold that position, and I would say, as you know, well, as a skeptical. Um, from a skeptical position I can understand that point of view I can understand that you say that yeah a lot of these accounts like sound really good but in order to sort of lean towards being you know convinced of the reality of the alleged creature I'm going to need you know a lot more uh, convincing evidence not not just accounts not anecdotes not even photographs but you're going to have to have uh, actual physical evidence the same as we have for the animal species that we have recognized as valid so yeah i'm definitely on the skeptical side of things but that's not the same as being dismissive do you think there's a natural overlap between people who are interested in dead creatures that we can confirm like dinosaurs and creatures that may or may not exist yeah um very interesting uh question um yeah, yes and no. Um, I mean, I think that people that tend to be interested in, um, you know, let's face it, I mean, a lot of interest in um, extinct animals, people that are interested in extinct animals are often interested in weird stuff, interested in weird animals. A lot of extinct animals are quite niche and uh, unusual. And so people that are, you know, have gotten really into the world of extinct animals tend to have quite good knowledge of weird and unusual things in the living you know fauna and part of that if you go and read books on you know weird animals unusual animals that we know are real you'll always get this bit a sort of couple of pages at the back where they say oh and there's these other creatures that might exist rumored to exist you get a sort of cryptozoal dissection in a book that's otherwise devoted to to uh, unusual creatures so yes so i think there's there's some overlap more importantly there's an overlap because um because the various um monsters around the world and monsters air quotes the monsters that people claim to have seen because they don't match things that are generally recognized as being alive um by science the uh, default explanation for a lot of them is that ah but it does sound like this thing that we know as a fossil from you know the miocene 15 million years ago or even from the cretaceous like 100 million years ago so there's a vast number i mean tens of claims made in the cryptozoological literature about animals known only as fossils surviving to the present and thereby explaining cryptids so if you're interested in paleontology you're interested in long extinct animals you will tend to bump into the idea that that oh by the way cryptozoologists have claimed that you know this group of animals didn't go extinct 66 million years ago or whatever but they have survived to the present so you could be a like dedicated lifelong paleontologist and have no interaction with that field at all especially if you just don't regard it as it's not it's not like of direct interest to you or you don't regard it as you know valid enough to um warrant your time but there's other people including myself that have looked into this and it's like why are people saying that why are people claiming that for example plesiosaurs famous group of you know long neck marine reptiles claims that they survived the present why have cryptozoologists said that what's the actual evidential basis for that and uh the, and, and drilling down into that and writing about it and working out the, uh, you know, the, the changing ideas on um, uh, the survivor, survivorship potential for various extinct groups is something that I've, I've looked into. I've uh, gotten academic papers out of it and something that I think is, is worthy because it tracks um, society's changing views on prehistoric animals really quite closely. Uh, people's ideas on what um, living, let's, let's say that plesiosaurs have survived the modern day, people's ideas on what modern day plesiosaurs would look like have tracked our knowledge of fossil plesiosaurs. So, uh, so there's, yeah, so basically, yes, there is, there is an overlap and, uh, and I've, um, yeah, been involved in studying it. So speaking of these claims about plesiosaurs, uh, let's get into one of the most famous cryptids, the Loch Ness Monster. 
Uh, there's a very famous photo from 1934 that looks like a long necked dinosaur is poking out from Loch Ness in the Scottish Highlands. And people have come up with theories for what this creature could be for decades. So what do you think that this photo of the Loch Ness monster really is? Yeah, you're talking about yeah, the famous, um, the most famous Nessie photo and probably the most famous so-called monster photo, the, the surgeon's photo taken by Robert Kenneth Wilson in April 1934. And um, I mean, whole books have been written just about this, this photograph alone. And I, I always think an interesting thing worth saying about um, photos, claimed photos of monsters, is that unless you're really, really into the subject, you kind of pick up just your osmosis like, didn't someone show that was a hoax? Isn't there a story about it being a hoax? Yeah, I think so. That's the end of the story. Whereas if you really get into it, the the, the stories are they're, they're just they're so complicated. So um, it's been claimed over the years that the uh, object in that photo might be quite large, like might be as much as sort of like a, a meter tall above the surface of the water. Um, the finding the actual original um, uh, copies of the photo have always like been the kind of holy grail because normally you see this like tightly cropped version where the monster is quite big but you can see from the size of the ripples that the um well the you can infer you don't have to be an expert on wave dynamics or anything but you can work out that the object isn't very big the water doesn't look it doesn't look big it's not big water so um i think that the object is tiny like 30 centimeters tall or something Seen within that context, you know, some people have said, could it be like the tail of a diving otter or the neck of a water bird or something? And I've never been convinced by those. The object just doesn't look right for that. So in the 1990s, early 1990s, a man called Christian Sperling came forward and said that he, together with his um, stepbrother and uh, stepfather, they'd deliberately hoaxed this and they'd used a little model clockwork submarine with a mon model monster's head made of plastic wood which was a thing in the 1930s it did exist in 1934 they made this and they set it up in the lock in a little kind of bay where they thought the ripples would make the object look quite large and they said that in the original photo they deliberately did it so you could see that it was Loch Ness you could see the the bank on the opposite shore and um, that they took these photos, they deliberately used the camera belonging to uh, Dr. Wilson, R.K. Wilson, because as a London-based, I mean, he was called the surgeon, he was actually a medical practitioner of a different kind involved in, um, he was a gynecologist, but uh, uh, he was seen as like a, a, um, a very sort of reputable source, a, a good person to, you know, to, to claim that he'd taken the photos and apparently he had a great sense of humor and he was more than happy to uh, play along with this. There's a, there's a backstory to the taking of the photograph, which is that Christian Sperling's um, stepfather, uh, Marmaduke Weatherall, um, had, it's so difficult to remember all the names, there's just so much information. The Duke Weatherall had also in 1934, he'd taken some fake, um, some photos of fake Nessie footprints on the shore of the lock made with a hippo foot. And he'd sold these to, he worked at the time for the Daily Mail newspaper. He thought it was all a bit of a laugh and the Daily Mail would go along with it. And, you know, front page of the Daily Mail, you know, Nessie's Nessie footprints found, but they didn't. They kind of dropped him in it. And they said, this is an obvious hoax. This man is a charlatan. <laughs> and, uh, and he wasn't very happy about that. So the story is that, together with his uh, his um, his son and his um, stepson he um uh, yeah he he, he 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 was involved in the hoaxing of this um, submarine photo more recently um, uncropped versions of the photo have been found and they do confirm that you can see the bank on the other side they seem to confirm what Christian Sperling said and in uh, high resolution scans of the photo you can see wires attached to the front and back of the object so of course if you're going to like release a model submarine into the lock and just let it you know pootle away into the water you don't want it to just like disappear uh Loch Ness is, is like more than a kilometer wide you want to control it so it makes sense that you have wires so 
Uh, and there's there's even more to the story than that. There's I, I'm not going to carry on with it, but I, I just say there is a there's a compelling paper trail which demonstrates that Christian Sperling's story about it being hoaxed in 1934, about R.K. Wilson being a stooge who didn't really take the photo but was happy to say that he did. There is there's like backup for this idea. So the most famous Nessie photograph is not a photo of an animal. It is indeed a uh, uh, quite good hoax or well, quite good I mean an, an okay hoax and we have a question about faked evidence like that hoax uh, from Lara in Santa Clara California go ahead Lara hi there I'm wondering what's the best faked evidence for a crypto that you've heard of yeah, thanks. That's a that's a great question, and uh, because there's there's quite a few, um, so I'm going to tell you about my favourite photo, my favourite um, indisputable hoax, um, or, or fake faked photo, your fake or hoax. I never actually know which uh, which term's best. Um, I mean, I should say to start with, there's a whole bunch of um, uh, probable um, <laughs> lights went out. Um, a, a bunch of like pieces of cryptozoological evidence where we don't know either way. You know, we still dispute, we still debate as to whether they're uh, legitimate or not. But let's go with one that's a, a definite hoax, and it's the Robert Lasseric 1964 Hook Island sea monster photo. So I'm sure you've all heard of Nessie and Loch Ness. You probably haven't heard of this one, but it's the best sea monster photo ever taken. I, I say photo; it's not a photo. It's actually a sequence of photos. So in 1964, a French man named Robert Le Serac, went um, on vacation with his family and his friend Hank de Jong to Hook Island, which is part of Queensland, Australia. And in Stonehaven Bay, Hook Island, um, Le Serac said that they all discovered this gigantic tadpole-shaped monster resting in the lagoon. And if you Use your favorite internet search engine and just do Hook Island Sea Monster. You'll see photographs of this immense, very dark tadpole shaped monster sat at the bottom of the lagoon with a person and a little boat behind it. And like I say, it's part of a sequence. They, they approach quite closely to this creature. They look down on its head from above. You can see it's got two little pale eyes. They said that on the base, at the base of its tail, there was a big white scrape and they reckoned it it had suffered from a collision with a ship and it was resting in the lagoon. The Serik and Jong supposedly um, dove and you know went up close to the creature um, underwater and it opened its mouth and swam towards them and so they retreated. Um, and the photos, they're just great. I mean, they, they really look like photos of a real sea monster. Um, there's a prominent person in the history of cryptozoology called Dr. Bernard Hoovermans. He was the guy who wrote the sort of pioneering volumes on the subject, mostly during the 1950s, died in 2001. And he was based in France. And for his 1968 book, In the Wake of the Sea Serpents, he found out as much as he could about Lacerra because he was really interested in this Hook Island sea monster story. And... Um, now, this is a case where how much circumstantial evidence do you need to be convinced of something? Hooverman's found that Lacerric was regarded by every, everyone that he was sort of involved with and knew as kind of an untrustworthy character. He left various unpaid debts. He was wanted by Interpol. And uh, so on the one hand, you could say, well, being a shady character doesn't stop you from encountering a real sea monster. Um, but Lacerric told people before leaving France, that he was going to go away and make money from a hoax involving a sea monster. And, <laughs> I, think, and I think, I think that's slightly suspicious, a slightly suspicious coincidence. Just a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, on that basis, Hoovermans concluded that it probably was a hoax. So did um, Hoovermans's mentor and friend, Ivan T. Sanderson, who also wrote, wrote widely about um mystery animals and they both tried to come up with uh, various explanations as to how it could have been hoaxed and what's most likely is that they used some kind of like giant like uh, plastic sheeting or kind of giant bag like structure that you could tow along and make it look kind of like tadpole shaped but um yeah really interesting uh, like my favourite sea monster photos, and, and frankly, the only <laughs> the only good sea monster photos. But that is my favourite monster hoax slash fake. So I hope that answers your question. 
Let's move from from the sea uh, back onto land and talk about possibly the most famous cryptid here in the U.S., Bigfoot. So similar to the Loch Ness Monster, one of the most famous pieces of uh, quote unquote evidence that exists is this old video uh, of what looks like some sort of ape walking in the forest. And many skeptics think that this video was completely faked. What's your take on the Bigfoot tape? <laughs> yeah, um, you're going to have to like tell me when to stop talking because again, you could just I'll try and keep it brief. You could just th th there's whole books written about this. So Sophie is describing there the Patterson film, sometimes called the Patterson Gimlin film or the PG film. It was supposedly taken on October 20th, 1967. And so we just celebrated the 54th um, anniversary of when they're supposed to have filmed it. So this was at Bluff Creek in California. Roger Patterson and Bob Giblin specifically went to Bluff Creek because of like uh, a big for activity that was supposed to have happened, you know, there before. And so Northern California is meant to be uh, one of the hotspots for Bigfoot. They were specifically Patterson and Giblin. This is their, this is their story. So their story is they were specifically looking for Bigfoot. They're on their horses. They walk into into Bluff Creek alongside the creek of Bluff Creek and squatting at the side, possibly drinking. Uh, accounts are different they um they see an obviously female bigfoot who stands up and strides like from left to right um, and just keeps walking she just keeps going patterson uh he, he, according to some accounts his horse or pony was scared and his horse like you know reared and, and patterson fell off but he managed to get the camera we know exactly what kind of camera uh, he used a huge amount of research has been done on the camera and its frame rate, which is something that's very important to how the the object in the film looks. And he recorded about uh, it's about a minute of of footage of this creature affectionately known as Patty to people in the Bigfoot community. And um, you, I'm sure most of you know, know the footage in particular, you probably know frame 352, which is the famous shot where she's striding like with her legs uh, arms even um um it really it's really well framed it's like a, a iconic bit of a americana really um so among those people that are quite committed to the existence of bigfoot the patterson film patterson i should try and pronounce my words <laughs> less english um the patterson uh film is um you know one of the best bits of evidence we have and there are people that include qualified primatologists anthropologists people that are experts in movement and and, and stuff they have actually said that this doesn't have the proportions of a human it's uh you know it's it's arms are like longer than those of humans it's uh, head to total height ratio is slightly different from that of humans aspects of its musculature the movement of its pelt and various other of its parts look absolutely accurate its gait is not like that of a human it's walking with a compliant gait which means it's like bending bending its knees in a certain way and it's got like a particular kind of stride that's different from from our species and um this what i what i mentioned earlier about frame rate some people have said that if you work out um the dist how quickly it was moving and how wide it's um uh uh how wide its pace was, how long its uh, steps were, it, what its gait was, then basically humans can't replicate this gait at whatever frame speed, whether it was 14, 16, 18 frames per second, I think is the, is the, is the debate. So that's the kind of pro Bigfoot stance. Um, now on the other side of things, um, the skeptical side of things and the sort of way I've tended to lean in my more recent writings, because I've flipped and flopped on this on this footage, I've been very inconsistent on this. My current thinking is that um, a lot of the things that are said to be like compelling and anatomically interesting about it could actually be faked uh, by a person in moving in a particular way. So things like like walking with a, a compliant gait, gait, like moving with bent limbs and swinging your arms a lot and stuff, you know, a person can do that. This claim about the proportions being utterly different from Homo sapiens is, is not true. The proportions are not that different from us. And um, um, we've got this 
massive amount of circumstantial data compiled by an author called Greg Long, who wrote a book called The Making of Bigfoot. I think it was published in 2004. Not a very fun read. I didn't like the book at all. But um, he does a really good job of showing that this is an important thing for a lot of these cryptozoological stories. Roger Patterson is not just some guy with a camera. He's not a guy who goes into the woods and, oh, this Bigfoot gets on film. He's someone who's got like years and years of background of being obsessed with Bigfoot and specifically of drawing Bigfoot, building life-size Bigfoot illustrations and of basically using Bigfoot as a way of making money. In a book that he published in 1966, that's a year before he made this film, um, or recorded this footage, however you want to say it. In 1966, Patterson drew the William Rowe encounter from the late 50s. So William Rowe is this guy who in Canada claims that, and his, his own story is quite complicated and it's wrapped up with all that, loads of other stuff, but William Rowe claims that he observes, while with his gun, he observes an obviously female Bigfoot in a forest clearing, she's eating leaves, and um, and then she realizes she's being watched, and stands up and strides across the clearing, and um, and and gave quite a good description of what he saw to his daughter, who drew a uh, a, a very distinctively proportioned Bigfoot, and Patterson drew his take on the row encounter in '66, and it's basically almost like a kind of prototype storyboarded version of what Patterson filmed in 1967. So an obviously female Bigfoot striding across the clearing, bending knees and uh, swinging arms in a certain way and moving across the clearing. In the drawing, the Bigfoot is moving from right to left, whereas in the Patterson film, the animal moves from left to right. But otherwise, all the details are the same. Remember that when Patterson was filming the animal. He was with his friend Bob Gimlin, and Gimlin said that he was he had his gun trained on the creature the whole time because they were actually supposedly concerned that it might, you know, rush them. So I can't shake this. I can't like lose the importance, the potential importance of this uh, this whole aspect of the story. If if Patterson was just some guy who went into the woods and just like recorded the best Bigfoot film ever, then maybe it would seem more powerful but the fact that he's got this long background of like you know looking for Bigfoot of making films about Bigfoot he's excellent uh, artist designer and craftsman and in 1966 the year before he films the Bluff Creek film uh, the year before he did it he draws what really well it's a really nice illustration but he, he draws like a, what looks like a sort of storyboarded prototype of what he filmed in 1967 so that kind of you, you just you just can't shake that that fact i think so that even so today um this is becoming more and more well known among people that are interested in bigfoot it means that even if even among those who do think that bigfoot probably is real for you know whatever reason because they're convinced by eyewitness um, testimony or, or whatever um, though even those people still have to say that we probably can't use the Patterson film as this kind of like key bit of evidence because it's got those issues attached to it so in a nutshell like briefly summarized that Sophie is my uh, sort of main take on the on the Patterson film yeah and even today, there's people who believe in Bigfoot. There's TV shows all about looking for Bigfoot. It's, as we've said, it's one of the most famous cryptids out there. So why do you think it's Bigfoot that's gotten this level of fame? What is it about this particular creature that's captured the imagination? Yeah, I would say interest uh, in a Bigfoot and possibly belief in Bigfoot is, is on the up. And not just in your country and Canada as well, but... Um, probably worldwide I mean the success of the TV show um, Finding Bigfoot um, means that you know here in the UK there's, there's like a massive pro Bigfoot uh, contingent there's people that like are so obsessed with Bigfoot people go in, go looking for Bigfoot in England Ireland Scotland um, elsewhere over here so so it's big um, why is Bigfoot so fascinating um, I think first of all because it's you know like a gateway drug-ish 
<laughs> like, a gateway to, cryptid. To, a gateway, a gateway cryptid, even better. Yeah, a gateway cryptid to um, the whole subject of mystery animals. So I think most people are naturally quite interested in the world. You know, all these things that are claimed to exist by some people, and uh, Bigfoot is you know at the front of the list. So it's like one of the first things that people you know they'll they'll hear about that or read about that before they will alleged sauropod dinosaurs of the Congo or the Mongolian death worm or the ropen of New Guinea or whatever, you know, big first thing they encounter. Then secondly, I think there's three things here. I'll see if I can remember all of them. That's the first thing. Second thing is that if the claims about Bigfoot are true, so what I often do with my research uh, is imagine that I'm in a world where the thing is real. So if you're talking about studying what cryptozoologists have said and written, you have to imagine that you're in their position. So imagine that you absolutely believe Bigfoot is real. What does that mean for your view of the world? Well, this would be, were it real, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, a uh, long list of claimed scientific names, uh, proposed scientific names been given to this, this creature. It would have to be one of the most remarkable creatures on the planet. We're pretty amazing animals, and we're really interested in things like, you know, bears, tigers, and gorillas and stuff. Bigfoot is like all of that, all of those things combined into one. You're talking about a human-shaped creature that is able to live in environments where we know we can't survive due to the extremities of you know cold and the elements and whatnot and it's probably got like uh you know advanced sort of social network there's it's not meant to be like a solitary creature it just lives on its own if you go into the literature there's lots of thinkings about you know bigfoot communication over long distances it's supposed to be incredibly vocal able to like use possibly infrasound as well as like long distance these remarkable like howls whales and this thing called it's been called samurai chatter uh, probably a very uh, inappropriate term but this 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 claim that it can use like this distinctive very deep kind of pseudo language or or true language there's claims that it's like a tool user a tool maker that it's very good at throwing things that it's basically a kind of like a superhuman creature a perfectly adapted for life in you know mountains and cold forests and whatnot not just cold forests i mean you know bigfoot is meant to be literally coast to coast north to south not just in north america but also to have a presence like elsewhere in the world as well um and it's meant to be able to run at 60 miles an hour and <laughs> like to possibly use telepathy and you know I'll, I'll stop there on terms of the uh the sort of fringe aspects to it but again, if you are living in a world where you imagine that Bigfoot is real, then it it would be like the most remarkable, the most remarkable creature. So I think secondly, that is the um, that is to people that have had encounters that they interpret as Bigfoot sightings. It's like an almost unshakable thing. It's like I think if you're really into it, you probably can't stop thinking about it. It's like every day you're pondering Bigfoot. It's like, wow, this thing. Oh, it's also super terrifying and probably predatory. It's not like in Harry and the Hendersons, this like friendly, you know, berry eating um, vegan creature. It's meant to be, um, yeah, truly like predatory and to probably, probably be responsible for loads of human disappearances. So there's that attached to it as well. And, and I've forgotten the third thing. I knew I would, it down. <laughs> but uh, you get you get the impression. I think that basically it's like gateway cryptid and just an absolutely like uh, unbelievable animal, I think is probably part of the reason why. Um, yeah. Oh, OK. So the third thing, very briefly, um, it's fundamentally Bigfoot is fundamentally a um, a creature that's like tight, tightly associated with the sense of wilderness. And that is also a big part of the appeal of cryptids and cryptozoology. So, you know, in North America, more so than we have here, you've got this like enormous, you know, hunting culture, this sort of wilderness loving culture. We don't have that because we've got rid of it. We don't have any wilderness. But um, it means that you can justifiably in the US or Canada, and I'm sure Mexico and other places as well, but you can, you know, go out on a trek, a day's drive from your door and be in deep wilderness and like think that you're looking for something really exciting and really new and um this is linked to all kinds of uh um aspects of uh 
um, the psyche, in particular, like, you know, rugged manliness. It's kind of, it's, don't get me wrong, yeah, it's no end of women interested in Bigfoot, but it is very much a uh, sort of a kind of like a, a macho thing as well. So, so there's also that interesting cultural component to the, the search for it. But uh, yeah. And now listener Gwyn has a question about physical evidence. Uh, Gwyn, go ahead. I, I, I would think that it would something at large would leave the same kind of evidence you would find in buffaloes or deers. You would, you would see where they were leaving paths and eating food. And if they ate animals, they would be bones and remains, or there would be definitely scat around um, that you could connect to these people, to these creatures. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a key point. Thanks very much. Um, so there's, uh, if we're sticking just with, I'm not sure if Gwyn's question was specifically about, about Bigfoot or about Mr. Creatures in general, but let's stick with Bigfoot. It's like, there is a lot of physical evidence that has been claimed. So obviously there's an enormous number of footprints. Now, again, you've got like the kind of believer or the, the sort of, um, the, uh, pro Bigfoot position, which is that these trackways uh they are this is the argument they can't just be made by people wearing like you know um wooden naked foot shapes strapped to their own feet they can't because they exhibit flexibility you see like spreading of the toes you see slips uh that match you know as if the animals was used as if the the, the track maker was using a, a large flexible foot that behaved like a real foot and there's also the, the claim that these tracks uh exhibit dermatoglyphs so they actually have preserved you know the little kind of ridges that we have on our digits as primates and it's also said that some of these tracks demonstrate a feature that supposedly isn't seen in humans it's been called the mid tarsal break the idea there's a flexible zone in the middle of the bigfoot foot which makes the bigfoot foot different from that of the human foot so um, bigfoot proponents say that these thousands of tracks do absolutely demonstrate the reality of this uh, creature and it's an interesting argument um, if you look at the specific uh, tracks that are supposed to exhibit these particular cases and you do, you know, you look at them skeptically, it's unfortunately, even the best of them are not, con they're not convincing enough for you to come away from the study of them and say, yeah, they definitely can't be explained as hoaxes. So the claimed dermatoglyphs, the little evidence for uh, ridges and creases, um, it's been shown by a researcher called Matt Crawley that we're always looking at uh, virtually always looking at plaster casts of the tracks and to make plaster casts, obviously you pour liquid plaster into a you know into a print and an artifact of the plaster pouring process is that plaster actually almost microscopically sets in incremental little layers and it turns out that that those mostly account for these claimed dermatoglyphs. In other cases, we know of uh, we know that hoaxers have deliberately pressed their own fingers or toes into uh, faked um, prints in order to leave, you know, dermatoglyphs actually made by a human. So the dermatoglyph evidence hasn't stood up. The mid tarsal break thing. This is quite a popular argument among uh, Bigfoot aficionados. Um, first of all, this structure is not um how do i say it is not not present it is present in some humans it's been claimed that it's like never present in humans no it is present in some humans some people have i forget it's not many it's i think it's less than 15 percent of the people that have been studied a, a sample of like 300 people were studied for a technical study and uh a bunch of us do have a flexible zone in the middle of our foot not just at the ankle not just at the toes so, and i also think that what's called a mid tarsal um uh evidence for a mid tarsal break in uh, bigfoot tracks i think it's another structure called a push-off ridge which is if you wear a fake foot or even with a shoe and you push off with the the toe end the distal end of your foot you can push up a bank of sediment in the middle of your uh, track 
And I think that's what Bigfoot researchers are calling the mid tarsal break. So I think that's a mistake. Um, other than that, so so trackway evidence, there's a lot of it. I'm not coming away from it thinking I'm absolutely convinced. Very briefly, the the hairs that have been studied, the DNA that's been studied. There's also nests. There's supposed Bigfoot excrement scat. Again, you could say some of it is is suggestive for the 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 hairs and for some DNA samples. There have been cases where it's been unidentifiable. It's like indeterminate. We can't say what it is. Um, people haven't convincingly, to my knowledge, and they certainly haven't published it, they haven't come away from analysis of a Bigfoot hair saying, we pinned this down to hominid, as in like great ape human family, and yet it doesn't match any of the known species. That hasn't, that hasn't been done yet. And if this was a real animal, and as our question has said, you know, if it's a real animal present coast to coast, north to south in, in North America, it should be leaving evidence of itself all over the place. It hasn't done that. Uh, loads of people that study, um, you know, hairs left by known mammal species and also DNA left in the environment, they are not finding unknown hominid material, unknown hominid, you know, hairs stuck to trees and stuck to the sort of, you know, glue traps and stuff they use to, to collect information on bears, wolverines, moose, um, whatever. So uh, I'm bothered by the, by the fact that that hasn't um, you know, panned out. And it really should have by now. If this animal is real, where is this evidence? And finally, the vocalizations. So all I'm these- sorry, uh, we're actually running low on time. So I just want to get one more question in here. I'd said uh, I would talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd like to talk about the, uh, the conspiracy side of cryptozoology. Um, many of us have grappled with how dangerous pseudoscience can be during this pandemic. And I don't think that looking for Bigfoot is as dangerous as people ignoring the scientific evidence on COVID-19. But I am wondering how you feel about this conspiracy side of cryptozoology and if it could be a gateway to other types of uh, more harmful pseudoscience. Yeah, yeah, that is something that has been considered quite a lot. Um, and there's different opinions on it. So there is a, a book called Abominable Science, uh, Loxton and Prothero, uh, a sceptical approach to cryptozoology. And the two authors in the final chapter, one of them says, Loxton says, he thinks cryptozoology is mostly harmless and is is in, has got warm feelings, basically, that even if people going in search of Bigfoot aren't really doing anything particularly useful, they're not doing any harm, and they are actually like doing a greater good because they're making themselves happier, they're connecting with the wilderness. The more connection people have with wild places, the more likely they are to, you know, want to hopefully preserve it and, you know, ensure its protection into the future, that kind of thing. Whereas Prothero says the opposite. He says that it has been shown, there are studies demonstrating this, that say a belief in Bigfoot is connected to um, beliefs in other things that, that are often regarded as part of the supernatural or the paranormal um, by sceptics, and that the belief in those is connected with a broader swathe of things that we kind of generally don't really want to persist in uh, culture like you know people that are big on like a belief in ufos and therefore you know uh, well sorry so belief in bigfoot therefore have belief in ufos and spirits and therefore tend to have like an interest in like conspiracy theories and then it's only like a couple of steps really before you are into a sort of problematic area so basically the argument there is something like interest in bigfoot is thin end of the wedge and uh, that's not difficult to demonstrate if you pick up a book that there's loads of it's called the unexplained and they'll have you know you'll buy them if you're interested in bigfoot because they got interest in they got sections on bigfoot but then you know also in the same uh the same work they will you know have stuff on like you know government conspiracies and are the illuminati real and are we controlled by lizard people and, and like i say it's only a couple of steps from there before you get to something that's uh probably not good for society as a whole so and, and i and i i don't know either way I, I would say it's kind of a mix of both things it's like a lot of cryptozoologists are perfectly sensible even pro-science people even qualified scientists 
and then there are others who yeah are are the opposite of that so there isn't a simple answer really to that so it's a good point that's about all the time we have for now uh, I'd like to thank my guest, Dr. Darren Nash, paleontologist and author based in Southampton in the United Kingdom. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It was great fun. Thank you.